Hi, this is a brief introduction to drinking water and sewage treatment for the freshwater ecology class. So the goals of treating drinking water are to provide safe water with no diseases or toxins, good tasting and smelling water, good looking water, so no sediment or color, low iron, and to soften water. That means to remove the calcium and magnesium. This is a very uh, brief overview and it doesn't necessarily hold for every system and the different methods are used for different things. But I just want to get an idea across of how this is, we're provided with clean water and how we get rid of our waste. So um, to start with, water is easier to treat if it starts clean. Um, some municipalities barely need to treat their water because they get it from very clean areas. So for example, Portland, Oregon gets a lot of rain and snow water from the mountains and it comes in really clean. Uh, other areas that, that are in more polluted areas have, have real, real issues with getting their water clean. There are some countries that assume people will filter and treat at the tap. So they'll provide water, but you have to take the microbes out and make sure the disease causing organisms are not there and have filtration or some other uh, clarification system. Toxins can be quite difficult to remove. Uh, they can be in, in low concentrations and dissolved. Um, activated charcoal can remove some um, organic toxins and there's some very large systems to remove organic toxins. Toxins can also include cyanotoxins from algal blooms and surface water sources. These can include microcystins, uh, which are hepatotoxins and also neurotoxins. Again, these need to be treated before they enter the drinking water system or the drinking water system has to be shut down until they are not present in the source water anymore. Water is often chlorinated with chlorine gas or chloramine before it's put into a distribution system. And that has to stay in the water long enough that it can stay sanitary until it gets to the tap. A chlorine can react with the organic materials and create toxic chlorohydrocarbons. Um, Oftentimes these are carcinogenic uh, compounds. And so you wanna keep the levels that you use low as you possible, possibly can. And many municipalities will add fluoride to strengthen teeth. Taste and odor can be a real problem uh, in many areas where surface water reservoirs are used and algal blooms cause taste and odor problems. It is difficult and expensive to remove and is one of the costs associated with eutrophication of fresh waters. Anoxic water can also smell of sulfur and other compounds and this can be remediated by aeration. You have to remove sediments. Nobody wants to get a, a turbid drink of water out of the tap and either settle them out or fil filter them or both. Some waters have organic materials and colored brown. Generally, this is unfit for drinking water. Iron can also dissolve in anoxic water. When this water is aerated, the iron precipitate has ferric hydroxide forming a flocculent rust. This is more common in wells, uh, private well systems where you pull up anoxic uh, drinking water and so it has to be treated. Softening water, uh, high levels of calcium and magnesium make it soap ineffective, and they can also cause scale and deposits and form on pipes. So it makes your plumbing wear out quicker, as well as the distribution system and pipes that come into the houses. This is a particular problem in karst regions or other areas with high dissolved materials. Water treatment plants use lime to soften water by precipitating out the calcium and magnesium. Additionally, some homes, private homes can have water softening systems and it's common where well water is used. So that's how it gets to your tap. And then once you flush uh, or run down the sink, then it has to be treated. It, the water has to be treated to remove pathogens, remove organic material. And this is called biochemical oxygen demand. It is the demand of all the chemicals and the organisms in the water for oxygen. This is important because if you dump this into streams or rivers, you can have all the oxygen removed there and it will kill the organisms in there. Remove the nutrients. Uh, this is becoming more important as we try to uh, decrease eutrophication problems and de decrease odors associated with sewage. So want to have a well-run well sewage plant will not stink up the entire town. There's general steps to sewage treatment. And again, there's a variety of ways people do this. So this is, this is just an overview of roughly some of the ways. The primary treatment, you need to remove the solids from the liquid phase and remove large objects. The secondary treatment, remove pathogens or respire away organic material, lower levels of ammonium because ammonium is toxic to organisms and streams and rivers and digest the sludge. And tertiary treatment, 
there are some systems that have advanced nutrient removal to stop eutrophication downstream. Primary treatment, you remove the large solid objects. So plastic, people flush all kinds of stuff down, down the toilet. Um, grit and rocks get into the system. They need to be settled out. They can't be treated. If flows too high as it comes into the plant, uh, it needs to be diverted to holding tanks. This happens oftentimes with heavy rain because septic systems are supposed to be separated from storm drains, but they do leak. And so there's a much higher flow during rainstorms. And then at times when everybody uses a bathroom like at halftime of Super Bowl, you might get a big pulse of stuff coming through. Um, you can settle out some of the sludge and divert it to the sludge digester at this point. Some systems might do that. The other thing is that most sewage plants are at the very lowest part of the city, so water feeds in by gravity. They have to pump the, the uh, sewage up into the higher point in the plant so it can run by gravity through the remainder of the plant. In secondary treatment, some plants have an aerobic step followed by an anaerobic step right at the beginning. This converts the ammonium to nitrate via nitrification and then denitrification reacts the nitrate with the organic carbon and the nitrate goes away as nitrogen gas into the atmosphere. So this is one way to remove nitrogen at the beginning of the system. The other ways are happening at the end in tertiary treatment. Next is activated sludge where large blowers keep oxygen in solution. So this is a mixture of some of the solids and liquids all kept up in suspension and there's a lot of microbial activity here. The microbes are respiring like crazy, so they're eating up that organic carbon and causing it to blow off as carbon dioxide. There's that active microbial community. Um, there's protozoa, they're eating the bacteria, and the oxygen maybe deactivates some of the bacteria that are obligate anaerobes. So it removes some of a lot of the pathogens at this step as well. And many viruses are inactivated here as well either with the oxygen or some of the chemicals that are floating around that are produced by the organisms that are living there. From here, as the organic carbon is brought down and the pathogens are decreased, it goes to secondary settling. And the liquid's released after it's, the settling happens, after the solids fall out of it. And that can be treated before it goes into a river or lake with uh, ultraviolet lights or the ocean. Some, some communities dump it into the ocean. And the solids, some are returned to activated sludge to seed the microbial community and keep it active and healthy. So you keep it really active by pumping some of those microbes that you settled out back into the system. And that really fortifies the microbial community and keeps them from washing out from the system and keeps them high. And the remainder goes to the sludge digestion. So I know this is complex, but I've got a really, really crude diagram of it. You have your inflowing sewage and there can be a denitrified nitrifying step, take out large particles before going to activate sludge. You go into the activated sludge and that microbial community decreases pathogens and VOD. From there, it goes to settling. The liquid goes off after it's uh, cleaned out and sometimes it's sanitized like with ultraviolet lights. They used to use uh, chlorine, but as I mentioned earlier, that can cause organic uh, chlorocarbons and, and they can be toxic. And then this can go to treat tertiary treatment or to the river. The solids that settle out, part of them are seeded back in here to keep the microbial community going, and the remainder go to sludge, sludge digestion. So this will further break down the sludge, decreasing pathogens more and BOD. So this is all the solid material. Eventually, as this is broken down far enough, it's dewatered and disposed of, or it can be used to fertilize cropland or something like that. So sludge digestion are solids in a very dense liquid with air pushed through in aerobic systems. This removes more BOD and pathogens, as I said. Because this stuff is more treated than, than some of the initial stuff coming in, it takes longer to get through this part of the system. There are, there are also anaerobic systems where um, they, the microbes are completely fermentative and going in under anaerobic processes. Again, it will outcompete pathogens and remove more BOD. This tends to generate methane because the redox gets so low. And some plants actually capture that methane and use it to, uh, as a source of power for the plant to pump uh, the water around or maybe heat it in cold climates. The spent sludge then separate out and dried and dispose of. It could be buried or used to fertilize fields because it has high nutrients. This is one place where the heavy metals might end up. So if somebody's um, you know, using chrome or something in, in industry in, in the city above, 
and inadvertently it puts it into the sewage treatment, then it can make the whole system uh, toxic. And, and these metals then really do have to be treated as, as a toxic material that needs to be disposed of. Tertiary treatment for nutrients, uh, you can use chemical methods to precipitate phosphorus. And, um, and so for example, it would be uh, precipitating with iron. And then that's pretty expensive, but, but where phosphorus needs to be dropped, it can be done that way. You can have another, another denitrification step to remove nitrogen. Some places use wetlands to scavenge nutrients. Uh, the, the water is dumped into the wetland and flows through and the plants take up the nutrients. Um, the plants need to be harvested periodically for that or also become oversaturated with nutrients. And then there'll be denitrification in the wetland as well that removes nitrogen. And there's some other schemes out there like biomass growth of algae or macrophage, which then use the nutrients and are harvested. <clears throat> 